Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the discussion today on Scotland's populations now and in the future. My name is Susan Murray and I am Director of the David Think Tank based in Edinburgh and I'm joined today by Dr. Esther Rufsedge and Professor Michael Anderson. Um, Esther is from the National Records of Scotland and Mike is from the University of Edinburgh and we're all delighted to be part of the Firestarter Festival again for this important subject and we really think the Firestarter Festival is a chance to think about learning and challenging ourselves and I think this last year gone has definitely been a chance that we really need to think about the populations now and in the future because it's really changed my thinking. We know there are many people joining us today who have roles which work with population projections so it's a chance to step back and hear from our two experts. So much has changed and if any of the implications it, so the implications now and in the future will really be unpicked today. Before I hand over to Esther and Mike, I have a couple of bits of housekeeping. We're recording the discussion today and we'll make it available on our website afterwards, along with the slides. Um, we will open it up for questions after the initial presentation. So please use the chat function to share your thoughts as you go. Um, and what I think will be many, many questions afterwards, um, I will try and group them as much as I can so that we can get through as many as possible. So without further ado, over to Esther and Mike. If you just unmute Mike. Is that better? Yeah. You're better? Yes. There go. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. Well, as this slide, um, as this slide says, um, we are living in uncertain times. In a sense, we always live in uncertain times, but um, we put COVID and Brexit together. Um, there are some real uncertainties, not least about what is going to happen to our population and its characteristics and the component parts that make it up. And as the slide asks, well, does it actually matter anyway? And um, I, I, I think we have no doubt that it does. We do need to try and make estimates about what's going to happen. Uh, we need for the um, uh, maternity services and actually also for those planning particularly nursery education to have some idea as to what's going to happen in, to birds over the next two or three years. Um, how much the population is going to age clearly affects um, healthcare planning but actually if a lot of people in their early um, uh, in, 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 in their late 60s die that has quite an interesting impact on for example pension funds. There's a lot of discussion about uh, declining um, uh, immigration and the effect that it may have on workers in key jobs. And of course, as um, people will say later on, um, local differences can make a huge difference to um, what may happen in the future. Depopulation, if population, for example, in the islands goes on falling, but uh, equally, and this is a topic of big dispute at the moment, particularly in England, um, if we don't build enough houses, or are we planning to build too many houses for the likely population in particular areas? And it's for this reason that NRS produces population projections, hoping to know, to give us some idea what might happen in the future. Esther. Um, so to see the challenges, let's first look at what's happened in the past, and then we can move on to what might happen in the future. So this chart shows the population of Scotland since the mid 19th century. Back then there were about 3 million people in Scotland and you can see that the population rose fast during the 19th century. And in the 20th century, it leveled out a lot more at about 5 million people. And then it's been increasing again since the start of the 21st century and the population of Scotland is now at its highest ever level. Um, at NRS, we produce projections looking at what the future might look like in the, what the population might look like in the future. The thick purple line in the center, that's the principal projections. That's what we expect is most likely to happen, but we produce a range of variant projections as well. So these are what might the population might look like if migration or fertility or life expectancy were higher or lower than we're expecting. 
and you can see with each of these projections the population as a whole is still expected to sort of grow compared to current levels the main exception is the low population projection and that combines low life expectancy and low migration and low fertility well um projections in the last few years have been working um reasonably well but they haven't always been like that when population projections first started in the uh, 1930s, some of them produced most amazing results. There was a very famous one done in 1935, suggested that the population of Scotland by uh, the end of the century might be about 2 million, and certainly wouldn't be uh, more than about 4.2. Uh, real, much more sophisticated projections started during and after the war, but uh, even the person who was responsible for invest inventing a lot of the techniques we use now, when he projected uh, in 1947 the population of Great, um, Great Britain for 2007, um, he predicted it as being, well, somewhere between 40 and 57 million. It was actually uh, over 59 million. Perhaps more uh, concerningly, um, the population projections for 2001, done in 2001 by um, NRS's predecessor organisation, predicted that by 2020, i.e. by now, we would have had a 1% fall in population. We actually have had an 8% rise. That's a difference of 360,000 people. So how do even the experts sometimes get it wrong? Um, so we'll talk about what projections are and what they aren't. So projections are the estimated, we take the estimated population and then we incorporate a set of assumptions about future fertility, mortality and migration. And these assumptions are based on analysis of past trends, plus um, we incorporate some expert advice. So they're not exact because what happens in reality is never going to exactly match this. But importantly, they're not forecasts, so they're not based on predictions about future political and economic changes. So they don't take account, for example, of future changes to policies on house building or migration or future pandemics. Um, and we always make this really clear when we publish this, the projections and also whenever we talk about them. Um, so there are three things that get incorporated into the projections and affect the population. It's births, deaths and migration. And we'll look at each of these three in turn. So this chart shows the number of births each year since the mid 19th century. You can see the big impact that the world wars had where birth rates fell and then we had big baby booms after each of the world wars. And you can see there's been an overall decline in birth rates over the course of time, but fluctuations as well. So you can see, for example, the 1960s baby boom here. And um, uh, if we look at this graph, it becomes pretty clear uh, why some of the, the projections that were made in the past um, uh, were not very accurate. The 1930s and the 1940s projections uh, all assumed that the birth rate would stay at that very low level that it was uh, in the interwar period. You can see there, uh, 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 that's right, Esther is now marking it for us, uh, that particular period there. And if you projected forward from there, then indeed you end up with very low populations indeed within the half a century. Um, after 2001, um, the 2001 projections were produced, um, things started to change. The population had been falling and then the birth rate uh, actually increased, as you can see from 2001 up, that's, that, that one's there. And in fact, as we'll see in a minute, mortality fell and we also moved to have net uh, immigration. Um, so the second factor is number of deaths, and this shows the number of deaths each year, again, since the mid-19th century. And yes, you probably already noticed at the end here, we've got an increase in the provisional figures for 2020 due to COVID. And we're going to talk a bit later on some more about how COVID might be impacting on our population. Number of deaths is obviously affected by the size of the population and the age structure of the population. So we also produce figures on life expectancy and that takes these things into account so it makes it easier to make comparisons between uh, different areas and changes over time. So this looks at life expectancy for women and for men since the um, early 1980s. And you can see that life expectancy was steadily increasing um, year after year for decades. But you can also see that it's now stopped increasing, which is worrying. 
And um, this isn't because life expectancy of Scotland has reached a natural peak and it's not any higher that it could go because we know that all other parts of the UK, every country, other country in Western Europe, quite a few other countries have higher life expectancy than Scotland. So it's not because we've reached some sort of natural peak. Um, and then the third factor that affects the size of the population is migration. This shows net migration. So that's the number of people moving to Scotland minus the number leaving Scotland each year. And you can see how much this changed and also how much it fluctuates. So from pretty much the whole of the 20th century and quite a long time before then, far more people left Scotland every year than moved to Scotland. So we had net out migration. But that changed around the turn of the 21st century. And you can see we now have more people moving to Scotland each year than leaving. Um, so this is why, as Mike said, the projections that we were producing um, back in 2000 were showing population falling because they were based on past trends. But then um, the trends changed and we've, that's why we've had the populations been growing rather than falling um, since the turn of the century. So, I mean, um, I think it's very clear then that um, projecting is difficult, uh, particularly when trends are changing. But if you come along also with COVID, um, then you add in, of course, a whole extra factor. And one of the uh, questions that's been much debated is, um, what's the short run consequence for fertility of many more couples stuck at home together in lockdown? And there's been, so far, very little real data on this, and speculation's gone two ways. Um, we know that if couples are um, together at Christmas and New Year, add in perhaps a little alcohol, um, nine months later, there is always a little surge in births. And uh, if couples are locked together for longer, and particularly if birth control and abortion services are not quite as effective as they have been, then you might expect more conceptions and therefore more births. But there is an alternative which has been discussed recently, which is that fall in IVF treatments might actually reduce births among older women and more, more births are actually being had by older women. And of course, it's also been speculated that lockdown might lead to people becoming gloomy and depressed and less likely to have sex. And indeed, even that the worries about post-lockdown unemployment might make couples more cautious. And indeed, there have been recent suggestions that we might be heading for a big baby bust. Now, um, actually, there's no published data on this. But um, we asked Public Health Scotland to um, tell us uh, if they knew about the number of attendances at antenatal clinics. And the uh, horizontal line through the middle shows the trend um, uh, or the pattern of antenatal uh, clinic um, uh, enrolments um, up to uh, the February 2020. And as you can see, as you would expect, it goes down at Christmas and uh, goes up again in New Year. But the interesting thing is the yellow blobs on the right hand side, which suggests that uh, since May, there has been a definite marked tendency for some reduction in attendance at antenatal clinics. It's maybe five to 10% uh, when compared with the previous year, though of course this might to a limited extent be people at least initially staying away from um, NHS services because they were afraid of actually catching COVID. So what about the impact on longer term trends in fertility? What might past experience um, suggest? Next slide, please, uh, Esther. Well, this is births. Uh, this is the birth chart again. And we've um, shown you, Mark, on this one, we've added two circles, which are red or orange, depending on the uh, colored display on your, um, on your screen. Um, and you can see that after the baby boom of um, uh, the 1960s, um, fertility fell rapidly until the uh, late mid 1970s, when it suddenly jumped up again. And research has shown that that jump is exactly correlated with a major pill scare. What happened was that research was published uh, su suggesting correctly, I think, that um, the then uh, contraceptive pill was leading to a marked increase in thrombosis among women. Women stopped taking the pill. Births went up. Actually, it wasn't in Scotland quite as simple as that, because 
Um, a lot of women didn't look for an alternative, particularly married women in their later 20s decided they would shift forward for a couple of years their birth planning. Actually, the impact on long-term births was pretty limited. And um, of course, on different occasions, uh, people have almost certainly um, planned to shift back their plans for a few years. Um, and that's the other thing. So little short-term bumps like that are um, uh, to be predicted and may not necessarily have that much effect in the longer run. But more generally, and the graph shows this quite nicely, um, severe economic downturns like the 1930s, where there was also a, a major uh, fear of war, um, clearly have normally been accompanied by significant reductions in fertility, while economic booms like the 1960s um, that should have shown a marked changes. So if we look at the right hand uh, ring now, there is the um, economic boom of the um, early 2000s going up very nicely and suddenly just after 2008, and this happened right across Western Europe. There was a piece published only a few weeks ago, which has demonstrated this unambiguously. Fertility everywhere started to fall. So if COVID and Brexit lead to even short term economic disruption and its uncertainty, which is often the key thing, then fertility would indeed be expected to fall even further than the level that it was already at in 2018. But, and this just shows the nature of the problem, uh, I think it's impossible at the moment to guess by how much, or crucially, for how long it will ask, or if, at last, sorry, or if birds will just be delayed. Now, what about the impact of uh, COVID on mortality? We can't hear you, Esther. I'm unmuted, right. Um, so what NRS is probably best known for at the moment is our weekly statistics on um, deaths involving COVID um, and the analysis that we produce of these figures. So this chart shows the age profiles for deaths involving COVID, which are in purple compared to all deaths. It's percentages. So uh, far more people have died of other causes than of COVID over the last year, but percentages let us compare the age profiles. And you can see that the age profiles look broadly similar, um, but deaths involving COVID have a slightly older age profile than deaths as a whole. And back in April, Neil Ferguson and a number of other people noted that uh, coincidence of pattern um, and suggested that maybe two thirds uh, um, of people who had died of COVID would have died in uh, 2020 anyway, because COVID was mainly killing the old and particularly people with multiple comorbidities. And that would mean actually that COVID would have had comparatively little impact on the overall number of deaths. But the next graph Esther. Yes, so, um, whoops, sorry, turned over too many pages. <laughs> right, so this graph shows deaths over the last year. And if we look first at the black line at the bottom, this is the number of COVID deaths. So we can see the peak back in March, April last year, and then how it fell and then increased again uh, later on in the year. Um, the purple line up above is deaths from all causes. That includes COVID and includes heart disease, cancer, dementia, etc. Um, and you can see how <laughs> the patterns sort of reflect each other. The dotted grey line is the average of the last five years. So um, the difference between the two is what we refer to as excess deaths. And uh, if we look at that graph, it's very obvious that the early excess deaths were not as you would have expected if people were going to die anyway, were not followed uh, by a marked uh, fall uh, in subsequent deaths. And this has been uh, exercising the actuaries quite considerably, and um, some of the actuarial literature on this is very interesting. Um, and it starts from the point that actually uh, a random man of 80 still has an expectation of life of eight years, and indeed a woman of nine years. And that in a normal year, even three quarters of men of 85 with three comorbidities 
could have been expected to survive for longer than a year. And if that was um, uh, applicable to the, uh, the COVID deaths, then perhaps only between 5 and 15% of COVID deaths were between people who would have died anyway in the year. And that might actually be quite good for pension funds, were it not for the fact that pension contributions have also been rising, uh, sorry, falling because of unemployment. Uh, actually, I think probably in the long run, we're going to find that it isn't quite as simple as that, because the average expectation of life in a care home in Scotland is not much more than two years. And given the high proportion of deaths in Scotland that have been incurred in, 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 in care homes, I suspect that the figure will actually turn out uh, to be a bit more than um, uh, 5 to 10 percent, because I think it's probably a reasonable assumption that the people in care homes uh, have the most severe comorbidities, and so they're not actually quite a random uh, section of the population. Um, and what about the impact of long COVID? So as I said, Scotland has um, relatively poor life expectancy compared to other countries. It's lower than anywhere else in the UK or anywhere in Western Europe. Um, and this chart, so the overall bars showed the length of total life expectancy and there are big gaps between the richest and the poorest areas. So the gap is um, about 10 years for women and even more than that for men. But we also have now have figures on the proportion of people's lives that they say they spend in good health and the gaps are even bigger here. So if we look here, this is females in the 10% most deprived areas expected to have about 50 years of life in good health, followed by 26 years in poor health on average. For women in the least deprived areas, that's 72 years. It's a massive difference um, between the most and the least deprived areas. And the gap's even bigger for men, but for men in the most deprived areas, just 47 years on average of good health um, compared to, again, 72 years in the least deprived areas. We don't know yet exactly what impact COVID and long COVID might have on these figures, um, but we do know that more people in the more deprived areas have caught COVID and more have died with COVID. So this could widen this gap even further as a result. And we need, of course, to add to this um, excess deaths from uh, too long untreated cancers and other life threatening conditions. So I think my own view is that either way, it seems pretty likely that for a few years at least, mortality levels will be somewhat higher than recent projections have suggested. A study last week from England and Wales suggested expectation of life would fall by uh, more than a year uh, and much more, of course, at older rather than younger ages. Um, and I think that is almost certainly on the basis of the long COVID and the delayed treatments likely to go on regardless of what may happen uh, to COVID mortality for uh, one or two more years at least. So what about migration? Well, here we enter even more uncertain territory, and this is made worse by the fact that um, COVID led to the uh, International um, Passenger Survey, uh, which is one of the main tools used to measure migration, um, being um, uh, uh, closed down, and we still don't have its administrative replacements. Anyway, if we look at what we think we might know, ONS estimated in 2019 that there were about 151,000 EU nationals working in Scotland. That's 6.7% of the population, 34,000 in key jobs. And the Scottish Government in February 2020 looked at the possible implications of the possible, uh, of the proposed new immigration policies and they looked at what would happen if there was a 50% reduction in EU immigration and one of a 30% uh, uh, reduction. Actually, the effects of those would not be as much as people might think, six and a half thousand, four and a half thousand, um, there would still be a surplus. If, of course, a very high proportion of EU nationals left, all in, uh, left almost immediately, or indeed have already left, as some people have suggested, then net migration might well have moved already and be going to stay below zero. And that would have, as the next slide shows, a much more serious impact. So what we have here are three projections um, based on lower migration. Um, and you can see the principal one, which was the one in purple on Esther's earlier graph, uh, 
And then what happens if you've got 50% lower migration and zero migration? And the difference uh, by 2043, it is a long time, is actually a population of the difference of about uh, 110,000. But population goes on growing to, even on that one, to about 2027. And of course, that's zero migration. If migration actually went markedly negative over successfully, successive years, that would have a much more significant effect. And if births remained low and mortality remained higher, then you would have got a very significant population decline. Meantime, however, there is one other important thing that we can look at, and that is the um, population change by age, again using those three um, principal, uh, the, 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 those three migration assumptions. Interestingly, the proportion of the population of pensionable age hardly changes, um, no matter what happens to migration. The population of working age actually does not decline by very much, though the age balance within that does. What the principal impact is, is to have a quite marked reduction on the percentage of children in the population. And I think that uh, is perhaps slightly unexpected, but presumably comes from the fact that migrants have, have had uh, uh, an age profile, which in particular, which has led to them having rather higher fertility. However, the other point I think that we have to stress is, as it says here, that even quite big changes in births, death and migration have surprisingly small impacts on long-term population profiles. Um, some uh, effects, uh, particularly what we've seen, for example, in birds, uh, partly cancel themselves out over a few years. And indeed, um, quite a lot of the elderly, even if they don't die this year with COVID, uh, with COVID, would have died in the next few years anyway. So actually, the age structure of the population is not necessarily going to be that much affected at least in the medium term. Esther has some lovely graphs. Yes. <laughs> so this shows the population of Scotland by age and sex. So we've got the figures for males and for females, and they go up by single year of age. We've got babies, one-year-olds, all the way up to the oldest age groups. And you can see some of the impacts that um, past events have had on our population profile now. So this peak here is the, um, the babies that were born in the post-World War II baby boom. They're now in their early 70s, um, but even though this happened so many decades ago, you can still see the impact on our population structure now. And likewise, this is the 1960s baby boom um, and, and so on. We can also look at equivalent projected figures for 2043. So this is 25 years into the future. So that's the black line. And you can see that the big, um, biggest change by far is in the number of pensioners. So this age group is projected to increase by about 23% over the next 25 years. Whereas the working age population is um, not projected to change overall in size. There'll be differences in certain age groups. And the number of children projected to fall. Um, by about 10 percent and that's the main projection but as I said we also produce variant projections so we can have a look at those too. So here the green area is the main projection and the black line is each of the variants for like low migration, low life expectancy, low fertility. We have high uh, variants of these as well but I picked out these ones to illustrate. And in a lot of cases, the differences are so small that if you're looking on this on a phone or a small screen, you might not even be able to tell that there is a difference between the great green area and the black line. It's a bit more obvious with the low fertility variant. So this is really important to understand because while there's all this uncertainty that we're talking about um, and what impact COVID and Brexit and other things might have on our population, there's also a lot that we do know about what will happen. Um, you know, there's, there's a great deal that we can predict with quite a degree of accuracy about the future age profile of the population. Um, we know, for example, it is going to continue um, aging under any of these scenarios.
Um, and then another question is how are the populations changing in different parts of the country? So this map shows projected change in the population over the next decade by each in each council area. The dark green areas are the areas with the biggest projected increase. So that's largely um, the areas in and around the main um, cities. Paler green areas are projected to grow, but not as fast. And the gray areas are where the uh, population is projected to fall. So it's quite a few councils in the west of the country, some of the island groups and a couple of other areas as well. And it's really important to understand this difference because meeting the needs of a population that's growing fast is um, a real challenge and meeting the needs of a population that's falling is also a challenge, but it's a different kind of challenge. So you need to know which challenge you're facing and looking at a single figure for Scotland hides so much variation that's going on across the country. This chart shows the same figures as the previous map, but just in chart format so that you can see the size of the change rather than just increase or decrease. So the areas of the biggest projected increases over the next decade are in the Lovians. You've got Mid Lovian at the top, followed by East Lovian and Edinburgh. West Lovian's not far behind. Um, in contrast, the areas of the biggest projected falls in population are West Niles, Inverclyde and Argyll and Butte, all of which are in the west of the country um, and all projected to fall by about 6%. Um, the age profiles of different parts of the country are also really different and I've picked out a few council areas which illustrate what different areas look like. So this is the Scotland age profile for 2018 which we were looking at earlier. Dumfries and Galloway on the top right here is more typical of a rural area that you've got a much older age structure to the population so far more people in the 50 plus age group and relatively fewer um, in the younger ages. Edinburgh is more typical of the cities in that you have lots of young adults so lots of young adults move to cities for work and for study they stay for a few years and some of them stay on, um, but quite a few leave again. So some might leave the country, but others um, quite often move to surrounding areas where it might be easier to afford to buy a property. And especially if you're thinking of starting a family. So one of the surrounding areas for Edinburgh is West Lovian. So you can see it's got almost the inverse age structure that you've got relatively few young adults, still quite a lot, um, but a bigger middle age population and also more um, children. So West Lovian is more typical of the sort of councils that surround the main cities in terms of its age structure. And uh, if you look at the um, projections, well, actually, um, they all show um, uh, that the population will be aging. And actually, they don't make that much um, difference. I mean, certainly some different planning will be needed, particularly in somewhere like Edinburgh, where the population um, is um, at the moment really quite young. Um, and indeed also in somewhere like West Lothian, but actually the differences are not nearly as big as uh, one might perhaps have expected. And so, in summary, um, well, it's difficult to produce projections, uh, particularly when things are changing as rapidly, and we've not come up really with any uh, answers, but hopefully at least we've raised a few uh, questions that you might not have thought of. But certainly there's quite a lot that we do know. We know that the overall age structure is pretty determined, pretty fixed by what happened well in the past. We know that the population uh, is aging and is going to go on aging almost regardless of what happens. And we know that there are these important variables that are going to continue uh, into, uh, in, into the future. And in fact, in my view, those are the things that we should perhaps particularly uh, be starting to focus on. Um, so if you want to find out more, all the figures that we've shown here today are available from the NRS website and they're freely available for anyone to use. We also have an open data platform um, if that's what you're more interested in. So, for example, on the NRS website, we have interactive charts where you can look at the projected population um, in different areas and look at, at under different variant projections um, and see how they compare. Um, our contact details are here, and we've also got all our Twitter details down the bottom. And so I think now is the time for you to uh, pose questions to us. But actually, 
uh, we know that in the um, audience today there are some people with, uh, um, in some areas, more expertise than us. So if they have suggestions and ideas that they want to pop in, please feel free to do so. And we will all wish to learn. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Esther. There's one question I'll start off with. Um, you mentioned in the, the blurb for the event um, a, a phrase that we haven't quite covered today. So how does all this link to the ghost of Christmas of the yet to come? <laughs> so this was me. I think it's the most poetic description I've ever seen of population projections and it was trying to explain how they're not necessarily what will happen they're more what would happen if past trends continued which is rather like the ghost of christmas yet to come in charles dickens a christmas carol <laughs> brilliant thank you esther so um i have a question from steve smallwood um it's in the q a box if you need to read it while i'm, I'm reading through it so the other consideration on future fertility disruption um is to do with couple formation so because we're all locked at home, we're not out in pubs meeting our future partners. Um, is is that showing up anywhere, or um, do we think it might have an effect? Um, it, I haven't seen any actual figures on that yet. I mean, certainly that's quite possible. And I've also known people who have gone the other way, who might have been in a relatively casual relationship to begin with, sort of got thrown together, ended up in lockdown and are now getting married probably sooner than they would have done. Um, but I, I, I don't think I've seen any figures to show what's happening yet or how much impact it might have. I no, I, I haven't either, no. I think um, have inquiries about d divorce lawyers gone up, I think. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, quite likely, but again, too early to tell yet. Mm -hmm. People might have inquired and then reviewed. <laughs> um, David yeah. Wood is asking us, there seems to be an undercurrent that declining population is a problem. Indeed, this could be a problem for individual countries, economies, and for government capacity to raise taxation. However, globally, human population growth has been huge in the last half century and it's a fundamental driver of climate change and environmental devastation. What policies should Scotland adopt to balance economic sustainability and the sustainability of government finances um, in its responsibilities toward environmental sustainability? Oh, big question there from David. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes well beyond uh, our remit. Um, and, um, but what I would say is that the biggest problem uh, might be the, the extent to which in order to balance the population, uh, to, to hold the, put the population down, the population has to age, inevitably will age quite markedly. And there are a number of consequences which have been discussed over many years of rapid declining populations. It was what was concerning people in the 19, 1930s. You get not only do you get an increasing um, uh, de uh, number of the population who are dependent and particularly need, uh, need help, you also <coughs> get uh, <coughs> for fewer and fewer um, uh, young people coming into the, um, uh, in, in, into the, uh, the labor force, and that is generally argued would significantly reduce um, flexibilities. Now, you can, of course, um, hope and expect I uh, won't tell you how old I am, but uh, you could hope and expect that the uh, older people will uh, step up to some extent and fill the gaps. But I think that is the big problem. I think you can stabilize populations. They can fall slowly, but if they fall rapidly, uh, then uh, the general argument has always been by economists and others that this does produce some quite significant economic um, uh, uh, problems as well as problems of supporting uh, an increasing, quote, burden of the ages, unquote. So one of one of the other trends um, that we spoke about last year, and I am fascinated by, um, is the fact that Scotland's become a net place for inward migration from the rest of the UK. Um, and we, Mike, you had some brilliant data on certain islands of Scotland that were now um, more than 30% um, retired English people. So coming to Scotland, cash rich, but maybe want to preserve that scenery around them and then leading to tensions in the local community about, you know, where the jobs come from if, if people don't want you to build a factory or those kind of related issues. And one of the things we've seen from the data coming out of estate agents is the mass influx of people um, looking to move to the country. 
And I wondered, some of those graphs on the areas that were projected to depopulate, if we could see that completely turned on its head. I, I think that's not impossible. I think turned on its head might be perhaps a little bit um, uh, uh, too hard to put it. But there is absolutely no doubt that at least at the moment, um, and I know this from talking to, to solicitors in, for example, Argyle, that um, there is a big, big, big um, attempt to buy uh, um, houses at what are often quite ridiculous prices. This, of course, does have a downside. It makes it more and more difficult for younger people to stay. So you could end up with an even more uh, imbalanced um, uh, population unless specific measures are taken to in increase um, in increase increase house um, house um, house availability um, at, at affordable prices. Um, and but I, I think what this actually clarifies very nicely is that population projections are based on what we know has happened so far and to a limited extent about what we think might happen in the future. But there has, for example, been some discussions as to whether or not population projections um, might actually try and pick up more of these specifically local details. But there are significant problems in doing that because um, local authorities are not necessarily the most reliable or indeed necessarily all able to provide that information um, as, as effectively as they might. So there are uh, real challenges in doing that, in, in um, NRS doing that, I can say this for NRS, I think. Um, it's quite reasonable that um, if local authorities wish to do it, they can do it for themselves. Come on. I think it'll be really interesting to watch. We'll be going to be publishing the new mid-year estimates in a couple of months time but that'll be 2020 figures and it's sort of going to be longer term um, but also we've seen like in in recent years more of the people moving to the more remote parts of, Sc of Scotland as you said Susan were more retired people but now if we have people thinking well if I don't have to be in the office five days a week I can work from um, a more remote area so it could sort of um, potentially have an impact with spreading out the population and it'll be really interesting to see how that happens. I mean, one of the interesting issues at the moment is exactly what those 2020 populations uh, will or should show. What do you do in somewhere like Edinburgh or Stirling, where the students have all gone, or significant numbers of the students have gone home? Do you actually take the 2020 population as what it would have been, what it actually is? Uh, what's going to happen in, in, in the rest of the UK with the 2021 census? Fortunately, in Scotland, we're not having a census till 2022. So our baseline, 2022 onwards, is likely to be significantly more robust than the 2021 one, which will potentially be skewed in all sorts of interesting ways. We have a question in about poor health, but just before that, I'm kind of reflecting on the potential data that we're beginning to see early signs of that there could be a move out to more countryside areas. Um, and uh, Nicholas Chadwick has asked a question about, um, has the time spent in poor health narrowed, widened, or stayed the same over the last 10 years? Sorry, say that again. Has yes. the, the poor health gap, has it narrowed or has it got bigger over the last 10 years? Um, in the so we just published new figures on healthy ex life expectancy uh, two weeks ago, and they showed a widening of, of the gap um, over the last year. Um, going back further than that, I'm not sure. I, f I um I think it's narrowed overall, but maybe that's starting to reverse. But I'd have to check with the figures. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we've got a question in, um, actually, Roy, Roy Lecky has hit the nail on the head here. Um, it was in the papers at the weekend about the potential immigration from Hong Kong. And I did reflect on something Mike said last year about Germany seizing the opportunity of taking the really high skilled people from Syria um, when the first phases of migration occurred. And it does make me wonder, can we do a, you know, we want the really high skilled people from Hong Kong to come to Scotland and do a mass advertising campaign? Or do you think people are on that already? <laughs> oh, that's a fascinating thought. <laughs> yeah, we don't, as I said, with the, 
projections we don't take account of like uh future things that will happen so but as they start to happen we sort of see what and obviously when we know something's happening we can start looking at the figures and see if there's any evidence but um whether we want to start advertising scotland is in um is hong kong is beyond my remit <laughs> <laughs> So, the Roy's actual question was, um, do we know if there's anyone that's doing estimates of what the migration might be? We, um, <laughs> in the past, we've used the International Passenger Survey to estimate in migration, and that does look at different nationalities, but the figures are quite small. But um, that's not going to be used anymore, and we're looking at alternative sources of information. Um, and I'm not sure how detailed they are there might be other people on, on the call who know a bit more about this than I do um, we, we certainly you know we, we're aware we we read the news we look at the things that are happening we try to look for them in the figures and try to reflect them as much as we can um, but it's just what data is actually available that's, that's, that's often the question yes I mean the, the there is a real problem at the moment over particularly um, uh, immigration figures where the experts tell me that actually we have real gaps at the moment in terms of having almost any idea um, of the um, uh, uh, of outflows um, because um, none of the surveys uh, that are done at the moment count outflows and we have no other evidence to I mean if you think about some of the things we do know we know about people moving around and we know about people coming in when they get national insurance numbers and we know um, from um, health records to some extent where people are moving but um, when somebody leaves the country they don't say oh I don't need my Nino anymore and they don't say um, and actually I don't need my doctor anymore they just go and so most of the ways that we have estimated and the International Passenger Survey helped in the past but it won't help in the future yeah yeah it's, it's really difficult it's as you say when people move into the country or signs of that people don't necessarily tell anyone that they're leaving the country um so we're looking at things like signs of activity so not just that they signed up for any national insurance number once but are they still doing things that implies that they're still in the country and using that rather than just the original figures and there's lots of research and my colleagues at office for national statistics and other departments are doing a lot on this um at the moment I I have questions coming in on everything from um, IVF data to Mori population projections and um, are they linked to the closing of the RAF bases um, and um, uh, yes, what are the plans now? International passenger survey are closed. Um, oh my goodness, where to start? <laughs> anything that you two think you've not covered that we should really explore a bit more? So, oh. one, sorry, go Mike. And um, one of the trends Esther and I have talked about before, and it's very early signs in ONS data, is that there's a trend of more intergenerational houses. So at the moment, we have a population and we're planning for um, more single person unit households. And yet there's this early signs that people are having a better quality of life um, when they're living together. Now that was pre-COVID because there's been evidence now that COVID has spread more in intergenerational households. So if we take that out the, the frame, um, the fact that you're more financially insecure and more likely to experience loneliness when you're living on your own, um, kind of, is there a link in the data on healthy life expectancy? Do we know whether or not um, there's anything related to how, what kind of housing units those people live in? Uh yeah, so you're right, this is something we haven't looked at. So as well as the population figures, we also produce figures on number of households and the overall trends have been more people living alone and in smaller households. But that's like shifted and especially in the cities, which I think is under pressure of like the expense, we've seen more um, that trend has sort of reversed. Um, healthy life expectancy linked to household type. Um, I mean, the short answer is no, not from the main figures, um, but whether that some information on health would be available from different sources. I'm thinking about maybe the Scottish Longitudinal Study, or even, I don't know if the Scottish Health um, Study 
probably has data on household type as well so it might be available but you'd have to take into account different factors so for example older people are more likely to live alone because if you imagine a family perhaps the children eventually leave home there's two of you and then one of you dies as one person living alone so you might see that people living alone have poor health or more likely to die but it might just be because they're more likely to be older so you'd have to try to take that into account mm -hmm. yeah it's an interesting question really complex i mean for the for the people from local government on the call who have to plan the future housing need and um i am completely in awe of the challenge ahead of you because when you take into account long covid and how that might change people's housing need um the challenges ahead i think are, are really significant um the other thing that's coming up um catherine's asked a question about um homeworking and how this might affect population we've kind of covered that a little bit in terms of might people move out of the city but i wonder in terms of housing need it might affect the kind of um dwellings people need as, as well um i'm just scrolling through the questions now just to see if there's anything we can um, can i just comment on the um uh, on, on, on on the housing projections i mean there are big battles going on almost now uh in parts of england where um, the councils are suddenly finding themselves having to plan for huge numbers of excess houses, partly on the basis of um, ONS um, uh, population projections. And there's quite some quite big arguments. I mean, it's actually got to the statistics authority now who are going to investigate how um, those population projections are actually made for um, uh, some local authorities, like, for example, Coventry where they um, say that their um, statistics don't appear to match the way that ONS produces their statistics. Now, uh, I've not actually heard, Esther, uh, any particular complaints about the way in which um, we do these things in, in Scotland. Um, None whatsoever. <laughs> no, everyone's entirely happy with everything we do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, I think the, the data and the trends in it, are, you say, are always tricky to predict because they're based on past patterns. Um, and I think what we found out from the last year is that our patterns are changing significantly at the moment. So mm -hmm. although we can learn from what's gone before, there is a challenge ahead about how we, how we make sure that we are questioning the predictions we've got and not assuming that the past will be the same as the future. I think that's absolutely yeah. right, Susan, but equally, we shouldn't assume um, that short term shocks will necessarily lead to major long term changes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the debates that are going on, even, for example, about homeworking at the moment, um, in a lot of organisations, they're starting to see in a big way some of the downsides, the absence of chats over coffee. Um, in, for example, quite a lot of the financial services, but equally in, 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 in areas, for example, some sorts of research. Um, there is at least one thing I've said in this paper, uh, where actually I picked up the appropriate um, reference only because I had chatted over coffee with somebody in an ONS meeting in London. And so I think there are um, forces that will push some things back the other way. And as we suggested, for example, with fertility, some of this is simply being quite possibly deferred. Now, there are problems in deferring because um, women's fecundity, um, particularly now women having children at older ages, will, will decline a bit. But actually, how much effect it will have, I think, in the longer run, remains a big question. Yeah, definitely. I think just looking at those graphs and, and the where you're seeing looking back in history where it had an impact, um, I think the, the idea that the, the financial uncertainty is, is bigger, it has a bigger implication for um, future fertility than many of the other things we may be seeing at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Okie doke. Well, we're we're coming to the end of our time together. Um, I, I've not quite got through all the questions, um, but I think we've touched on on most of them. Um, 
there is a question um, that I haven't got to, which is about um, a drop in reported crime in terms of <laughs> demographic change um, in the age, the 16 to 25 group. Is that, um, I'm not sure if Daniel's trying to get at prison populations, is he? Or um, I don't know, anyone else wants to have a look at that question on, on the Q&A? Yeah, um, there is. So um, crime rates have fallen since the 70s, I think, and there's been a lot of um, study into why this has happened. And because more crime is committed by young adults, I think the argument he's sort of making is that if if the population gets older, does that mean that crime rates are likely to fall? And I think that's um, probably true, but there are lots of other things that have had an impact as well. One is like phones and the internet mean young people have things to do other than hang out on, you know, street corners drinking cider. Um, and that that's had an impact. Even things uh, removing um, lead from petrol back in whenever the 70s and 80s they think has had an impact in terms of falling crime rates because we we don't sort of appreciate how much impact that was having uh, on people yeah but interestingly the oldest groups are more likely to be afraid of crime so as the population gets older we could have less crime but more fear of crime and indeed potentially even more reported crime yes <laughs> Steve Smallwood is asking if that's an insight from your youth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that might be a tricky one. Someone you know, maybe Esther. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> In fact, it was him I was referring to. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, um, I, as always, have learned a lot from both of you. And I think particularly this is the kind of event that I think Firestarter Festival is famous for because it really makes you think about your what, what data you're using and how do you challenge yourself to really think through that data um, and you know make sure that we are we aren't just programming the same stuff going forward and that we're, we're knowing the assumptions in the data that we use um, so thank you both ever so much for your time thank you to the Firestarter Festival the University of Edinburgh and the National Records of Scotland um, it's been an absolute joy working with you both uh, as all I, I love it um, and um, I, I think um, we will probably be back again, I would say, next year to reflect on this again, because I think the data over the course of 2021 will show us even more insights than it did in 2020. Um, so from the David Hume Institute, thank you to everyone in the audience. Um, thank you for all your questions. I'm really sorry if I didn't quite get to you. Um, we have another event next week with Professor Ben Friedman from um, the Harvard University um, in conversation with Dr. Catherine Trebek, um, looking at a very different subject but one that we are also very interested in. So um, thank you everyone very much for your time and I'm delighted to bring the event to a close on time. So um, yeah, a virtual clap to you all. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs>